Um, welcome to Cinema Academica, everyone. Uh, those of you who haven't been here, this is a weekly film and discussion series. Uh, started by tonight's speaker 10 years ago or so. And uh, we usually uh, discuss uh, films about different political, economic, social issues. And the uh, theme of the uh, whole film series is activism. Tonight's uh, presentation is about the uh, science and politics of uh, global, global warming, global climate change. Uh, Denis used to be a professor here at the university, and he published on uh, environmental geochemistry uh, at some points in time, in addition to physics. Um, so I think he's going to use his uh, expertise to uh, analyze the issue for us tonight. After the, well, usually after the movie, there's uh, an informal discussion, but I'm not, I'm not sure how the format's going to be tonight. Uh, it might be a bit different, but Denis can explain that. <laughs> Just in general, uh, we usually urge everyone to uh, try and express themselves and uh, don't be shy. There's no uh, real moderation uh, to the debate, but also try not to monopolize the floor, please. Thanks. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out here tonight. Um, I want to first uh, say that there will be There will be some physics tonight. I will actually explain some basic physics concepts. My idea is that in a problem that we, in a discussion in society, if you cannot, and a discussion that involves science, if you can't get a grip of this problem by using first year university physics, biology, earth sciences, chemistry, if you can't use first year level science to help you navigate the particular problem, then probably science is not going to be of any use to you anyways, of any use to anyone. Okay, that, that, that's what I've come to understand. And you'll see that I will use just the physics that I learned in high school and first year university and I wrote a scientific paper using just that physics to try and understand the climate. It sounds crazy, I know. They're talking about these supercomputers and all these sophisticated climate models. And you'll see that just by using some simple ideas of physics, you can show, without any doubt, that the IPCC and many of the textbooks and NASA on its website and so on are saying things that are absolutely wrong, incorrect. And so that already gives you a clue that maybe they're not thinking as clearly as they should be, and maybe this is, you know, this is, has uh, some politics involved instead of just pure science. So we are going to do just enough physics uh, to be able to do that. Now the last time I gave a talk about climate, because I've been very busy with other things, was at the a University of Montreal, and it was quite an auditorium full of people, and one of the students lent me a sweater to wear during the talk and, I'll, and eventually gave me the sweater when they found that I liked it. This, this is the sweater that I was given to wear during the climate talk, which I thought was quite funny. And during the talk, the, a, a different student drew a sketch of me wearing that sweater. <laughs> okay, so that's the history of uh, this talk in a sense. Now, there were a lot of faculty in the room and a lot of students and there was a, a generational gap in the conclusion after my talk. All the students believed what I'd said and the professors were angry and didn't believe it and they were going to have to work to try to convince the students that this wasn't true. Uh, so that's how that talk went. All right, now what I'm going to do at this stage is I'm going to um, talk about some of the physics and just show you some of the basic physics before we get into the politics and some of the other things. And so, I guess I'll want to write just a few equations down on the board. You see, in physics, we've come to understand something very important. There's a concept called energy. And energy can't disappear or be created out of nothing. And that's very fundamental. And it is a very powerful idea that allows you to do calculations that would otherwise be very, very complicated. Here, here's, here's a basic equation that we're going to use to calculate the temperature of the Earth, okay? 
intensity equals something called epsilon, which is the emissivity, a fundamental constant, okay, and temperature to the fourth power. That's a very important equation. What this says is that when a surface is at a certain temperature, any surface, this is a fundamental law of physics and how objects behave in the world. It says that when any surface, like the surface of this table, is existing at a certain temperature, it has a certain temperature, then it is emitting radiation at an intensity of this many watts per meter squared. So for every part of the surface, it's emitting a certain uh, amount of energy per unit time in watts, okay, so joules per second. It's energy is coming off of every bit of the surface in this amount. And to calculate that amount, you need to know the emissivity of the surface. That's a property of the surface. And that emissivity has to be between zero and one. So the emissivity is bigger than zero and smaller or equal to one, depending on the nature of the surface. I'll explain that in a minute. This is just a fundamental constant. It's a known physical constant. It has a certain value. It's fixed. It's known. It's established. It's known to great precision. It's just a constant. And this is the temperature, but in this equation, the temperature has to be expressed in degrees Kelvin, which is the natural, a, a natural scale for temperature. You see, because when you express things in degrees Kelvin, the zero means that things are so cold that the atoms don't move anymore. So that is the natural scale. To have a zero, that really means motionless matter. And then when, as you move up from there, you go to higher and higher temperatures in degrees Kelvin. And you take that temperature, the value of that temperature, and you put it to the fourth power. And that will give you the value of how much energy is coming off that surface. So we're all emitting energy as we speak. So our, our bodies, which are at higher temperatures than the table and so on, we're, we're all emitting energy. Uh, you can't see that light because it's infrared, because we're at low temperature compared to the sun, which is at a very high temperature, such that the light that it emits is at higher frequencies and is visible to the human eye. Okay, so that's a fundamental equation that we're going to use. And then there's something else you have to know, which is that a, a planet has something that we call an albedo. So eventually we're going to be modeling a planet and the sun is going to be shining on that planet and its surface is going to come to some temperature and as a result of being at that temperature the surface of the planet is going to emit energy at this rate for every square meter of that surface, okay? So that's what's going to happen. Now, this light that's coming from the sun, some of it gets reflected from the planet. So some of it gets absorbed by the surface so some of the energy gets trapped and serves to warm the surface and some of it gets reflected away from the surface and back into space. Now I'm starting with a simple case of a planet that has no atmosphere, just to simplify things. Okay? So this planet that has no atmosphere reflects some of that light and the fraction that is um, um, reflected back towards space. That's called the albedo. Yeah. And so we'll give it a symbol A. Okay? And that depends on the properties of that, of the surface. So different materials, different substances, sand, water, so on, they, they'll have different albedos. So you can measure the albedo of the Earth. So you send a, a satellite up in uh, in space surrounding the Earth and you measure how much of the light is being reflected towards this satellite and you try to do an average over the whole surface of the Earth and you work hard to measure for a long time and you orbit with your satellite and you do that on average and you get an average albedo and the average that you find is that the albedo of the Earth on average and I'll use these uh, angular brackets to represent an average is 0.0, .0 sorry, 0 
three, zero. So 30% of the light gets reflected. Turns out some clever people who just observe the moon and measure the light that is coming from the moon but that is first reflected by the earth, they can do way better than satellites. And the people who do that, they do what are called earth shine measurements. They have been able to determine a more precise value of this average albedo and they have determined that it's 0 0.297 plus or minus 0 0.005. So we know the average albedo of the Earth pretty well. Okay? That's the Earth as it is with its environment and its clouds and everything on average. The albedo of the Earth, if you took away the atmosphere, the clouds and everything, would be just the albedo of the Earth as it is without those things, so, but with its, let's say, with its vegetation, its sand, its continents, its oceans. That albedo is different because a lot of this reflection is reflection from clouds. So the albedo of the Earth without the atmosphere is 0 0.125, if I remember that number correctly. It's 1 to something. But it's lower, okay? So it's some lower value. So that's without the atmosphere. That's just something to keep in mind for later. Okay, so we've got, we've got those elements. And now we've got a basic equation that will allow us to balance energy. So, how did you measure the, the albedo of the Earth without the time? How is that measured? Um, you, have to, you have to measure the albedo or the reflectivity at the wavelength of visible light of all the different materials on the planet and do an average over the surface. Okay? So, uh, you can, so it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but you can do that. Or you can correct, you know, there's all kinds of ways you can do it but um, you're trying to see how much of the light that actually hits the surface is reflected back from that surface. I'm trying to show you the physics calculation, but I'm trying to do it one step at a time so that you can appreciate logically how this is constructed so that in the end you'll be able to, an you'll be able to understand where I'm going. Okay? So I, I, physicists do this all the time. They start by simplifying the problem. There's a joke in physics that, you know, th this is always the first time you do is you ultra simplify it to the point where sometimes it's not even recognizable that you're dealing with the same problem. Like, I don't know if you know the famous physics joke, and I'm sure only the physicists will laugh. Uh, there was a guy who uh, bet on horses, and he had a physicist friend, and so he wanted the physicist friend to help him figure out which horse would win, and the physicist friend said, well, let's start by assuming that the horse is spherical. <laughs> that's a physics joke okay uh, so that's what we're doing we're, we're, we're doing the uh, planetary physics of a spherical horse here or something like that and so if you have no atmosphere to start with then and you'll see you'll, the piece will come together really quickly this is going to be faster than you think so then here's what happens I'm going to say that the average, and I'll explain why it has to be an average, but the average intensity coming from the sun hitting the planet has to be equal to, so that's what's coming into the planet, and what comes into the planet has to be equal to what comes out, because the only energy source is the sun. And what comes out is what's reflected from the planet. So that's the albedo, the average albedo, times this. So the fraction that's reflected times the original. So that's this. So it has to be equal to that plus whatever other radiation is coming out. Something has to come out. It's not just disappearing. And what's coming out is what's being radiated from the surface. And what's being radiated from the surface is the emissivity of the surface of the Earth without an atmosphere, this fundamental constant, and the temperature of the surface of the Earth in degrees Kelvin to the fourth power. See, there's no other source of energy in this problem. 
we're not we're considering that the we're not considering any other source of energy. So all the energy is coming from the sun, and that sunlight is coming and hitting the planet and causing it to warm, and it, as it warms, it emits more and more radiation from its surface, and there comes a point where it's emitting as much as uh, that amount that it's emitting, plus the amount that it never received because it was reflected, is equal to the incoming amount, and then you've got an equilibrium, a kind of steady state, we call it, where you arrive at some temperature of the surface. You see, because if the temperature was lower, then the light would be absorbed by the surface until it gets hotter, until there's that balance. And if the temperature is too high, then it's emitting more than it's receiving, and therefore it'll cool. So because it can't, um, because in the end, you've got to come to an equilibrium because if, if, if it's too hot, it'll cool. And if it's too cold, it'll heat up because it's receiving more than it's giving. You see? So the balance of energy has to occur. This is called radiation balance. This is how physicists calculate the temperature of a planet out there in the universe anywhere. That's how it's done. So, this means that this is a fundamental equation that if you solve this equation for the temperature you will have obtained the temperature of the surface of that planet. So you can isolate temperature in this equation and find out what the temperature in steady state of that planet without an atmosphere is. That's how simple it is. That's all you need to do. And when I, when I was in first year physics my chemistry teacher at the time, the first assignment was this fictitious planet without an atmosphere, calculate, and he gave some constants in a, you know, in a star that has this intensity and so on, he says, calculate the temperature of the surface of that planet. And we're like, what? How am I going to do that? <laughs> you know? And this is, you had to go through this whole process in the, in the problem set to figure out how to get the temperature. Because at that time, you couldn't just Google it. You couldn't just <laughs> find the you know, temperature of planet, Google it, and then, oh, look, all these calculations come up. No, you had to actually talk with your friends and find out if someone had a clue of how to do this and you know, what were you going to do and how were you going to figure this out and so on. And eventually, some of us would, would be able to find the temperature of the planet and then you hand in your assignment and see what happens. So that was the first assignment I had at this university that many years ago, was to calculate uh, the, the temperature of the planet. And it, it was a, a chemistry problem at the time, not a physics problem. Okay, so that is quite doable. And when you do that calculation for the Earth, you get temperature of the surface of the Earth equals... Okay, now before I tell you the answer, do you know what the average surface temperature of the Earth is now, the real Earth? Do you know what it is, roughly? 15. 15 what? C. What's C? Celsius. Okay. Um, how many of you know the answer? I mean, let, 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 I just, 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 just want to see. How, how many of you have an idea what the surface temperature is? So two, one, two, two, two people. See, here we are, we're three people. I mean, no, I mean, doesn't it vary depending on the type of surface, like around the Earth, like a different around the surface of the ocean? Right, the absolutely, and we're going to talk about that. But, and we're going to talk about what does this average mean and so on. But the point, I, the first point I want to make is we are all being bombarded with global warming and how terrible it is, and none of us know what the average surface temperature of the Earth is. Good God, you'd think that the CBC would once in a while tell you what that is, right? They don't. And they don't tell you what it means if they give you a number. But, it, just, just for your information, the number that's given is, the, the, the classic number that's given is, it's about 14 degrees Celsius. Okay? Now that's the average surface temperature of the Earth. What do they mean by that? Well, what they mean is, you know, at the North Pole, the South Pole, it's really cold, the equator, it's hotter, 
winter, summer, you have to take an average over of a year and over the full surface and you can't count some of the temperatures more than others because that will skew the average. But wait a minute, we're only measuring temperature at weather stations and they're in certain places and they're at airports near cities. And so how the heck do you get an average when you're only measuring, you've only got let's say a thousand weather stations in a thousand cities that you've been measuring long, how do you get an average? So turns out it's very difficult to calculate this average. Uh, geographers are the huge ones that do it. They, do, they use sophisticated software and they divide the surface of the earth into these regions, provinces if you like, segments, and then they have to decide a temperature for each segment. So maybe there'll be there'll be three weather stations in this one, maybe there'll be two in this one, maybe there'll be ten over here, and maybe there'll be a whole bunch of segments that don't have any weather stations where they kind of have to guess, and so on and so on. So if you're doing it from weather stations, you have to calculate an average that way, and you have to make sure that you're calculating it right. And some weather stations, okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm getting off on a tangent here, but these, these weather stations are at airports, and the cities are getting bigger, and there's a thermal island around the city, so these, it's, it's getting hotter near the weather stations. Okay, you've got to be careful about that, got to correct for it. Uh, you don't want that to skew your data, and so on. Some of these stations, the people uh, who are manning the stations are not very good at their job. They're not very careful. They, don't, they leave the door on the, on the, on the thing open. They, they do all kinds of things, right? And uh, they don't point out when there's a problem, etc. You have to worry about all this you have, if you want good data. But in the end, most people agree that the average is about this, about 14 degrees Celsius. No, uh, what I, I would agree also that it's about this temperature, but I'm not sure if you could get it more precise than that. Okay? And it, the, the actual value is very sensitive to how you do this calculation and treat the data with the computer and everything. It's very sensitive to that. So I have a hard time understanding how by these kinds of methods you can see a one-tenth of a degree change from one year to the next or anything like that. You see, I have a really hard time with that. But that's a whole separate story. There have been studies, papers written about, by statisticians who say that that is strictly impossible. They just are not doing this. This is all bluff. There have been papers to that effect, okay? Um, and I also have a hard time understanding that. This is the intensity at the Earth of incident radiation from the external body. I would argue that that's actually the, the emissivity of the, of the Earth. No, sorry, not emissivity, that's the wrong word. The radiation being emitted by the Earth. What, this? Yes. Yeah, well that's what this equation says. But you're, you're using IS in two different functions there. Yeah. Two different uh, uses. You see, sorry, here I'm using it to mean this is the incoming radiation from the sun. But that's not really, the, to me that's not what this equation is saying. What that's saying is what's being emitted from the, the planet, in this case the Earth. No. This is an equation that equates what is striking the Earth in quantity to what is leaving the Earth on this side of the equation. Okay? This is what is striking the Earth coming from the Sun and in quantity per unit time per unit surface area of the Earth it has to be equal to the radiation leaving the planet on this side of the equation. So this equation uh, requires at steady state that you have conservation of energy. And so it equates what's striking the Earth on this side to what's leaving the Earth on this side. And what's leaving the Earth comes from two different things the part that's reflected from the surface of the Earth that was incident on it at first, it's reflected, and the part that the Earth is actually emitting as infrared radiation because okay. it has a certain temperature. So, so it is what's being emitted from the planet, but you're also saying that what's coming is also equal to what's being emitted. I'm saying that in steady state, what strikes the Earth has to be equal to what leaves the Earth because if it wasn't, the temperature would adjust until it was because if it was more that was impinging the Earth than what's leaving, then the temperature would increase until it's equal. And if it was less, then the temperature would decrease until it's equal. So this, is the, this, is, this, is, this was the crux of my first year chemistry problem. You had to understand that. If you, you, know, you had to get that. You had to get it. You had to say, 
Oh, yeah, right. That's why I can write this equation down. That's how this is going to work, you see? Okay? That's what this is about. So that's what this equation means. Now, you can solve this equation, and you see what we're talking about now, understanding this equation? That's where, that's where all the science is. That's where all the conceptual understanding is. That's where scientists should do most of their work when their students learning this stuff, right? That, that's the important part. The math of solving for t is a detail. That's not the important part, whereas too often that's where we put the emphasis. But that's a comment about education. All right. So, you solve for t. Of course, it's going to be in degrees Kelvin. You change it into degrees Celsius, and the answer is... Do you know what the answer is going to be? Does anyone know the answer to this? It's, it's, it's kind of well known and all the... Well, anyway, the answer is minus 19 degrees Celsius. So the Earth without an atmosphere would be a lot colder than it is now with the atmosphere, is what this is telling us. And this calculation of minus, minus 19 degrees Celsius that we just did, no scientist can do it better. That is the answer. Everyone agrees. All the NASA scientists, the IPCC, everybody agrees that this is the answer. You can't do the calculation any better than this. Okay? If you've got the right average albedo and the right average emissivity and, and you do the calculation, that's what you get. There's not a more sophisticated way to do the calculation. That is the answer given by science with our present state of knowledge. Okay? So, what so, the energy which is required to bring the Earth from minus 19 to 14 average? So, why is that not in that uh, formula? Because that's not what we're talking about right now. Okay? This is an observation of what the Earth is today. This is the result of the theoretical calculation that we've been describing for an Earth without an atmosphere. But we're just in our minds saying, okay, that's the result if the Earth did not have an atmosphere. It's robust. It's a good value. This is what the Earth really is today. So, therefore, and this is, this is where all the scientists will come to the following conclusion and you tell me if it's right or wrong. They're going to say, therefore, there's how much difference here? 19 minus and 14, so that gives you 33, right? 33 degrees Celsius. So there, there is a warming effect from the atmosphere that is that large, 33 degrees Celsius. And what they will say is, that means that there's 33 degrees warming due to the greenhouse effect. Okay? And you will find this in all the textbooks. And you'll find it on the NASA website. And you'll find it in the IPCC reports. And you're going to tell me what? The difference. It's just the difference between these two numbers. Yes, I understand. Well, well you, you see that from the calculation that we just did, and given what we're comparing to, it's the warming that's due to putting the actual atmosphere on the Earth, right? But what I'm telling you is that all the textbooks and everybody, the IPCC and everyone, will tell you something different. They will tell you, oh, well, that's the effect of the greenhouse effect, the planetary greenhouse effect, causes that amount of warming. But and it sounds reasonable. True, it? it sounds reasonable when you say that, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. No. But, but it's wrong. It's wrong. It's, it, do you know why? Sure. Because the albedo, when there's no clouds, is going to be different. Yes. And clouds are due to water vapor. And water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas. So if you eliminate greenhouse gas, you will have no water on the Earth. No water, no lakes, no oceans, and the albedo of the Earth would then be that of the moon, which is 0.12. Yeah, once you, once you dry everything and so on, you get rid of the vegetation. So, but, yes. And what Janine just said was the textbooks say the greenhouse effect. Right. 
Okay, right. Now that's right. From so what? From what the greenhouse gases that we're probably right. So what this gentleman is saying, there's a lot of really good thought in that, and so on, but it's not quite. It's not quite the answer completely. Okay. The 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 mistake. The main mistake is because putting the atmosphere in does add the planetary greenhouse effect. There's no denying that. So to go from this to that, you are adding the greenhouse effect. But the problem is, you're adding a lot more than that. You're adding a full atmosphere with all its complexity. And when you look at what that atmosphere does, a lot of what it does is cool the surface of the planet by various other processes. And one of those processes is evaporation of water from the surface, which requires a lot of energy. Okay? So once you put on the atmosphere, the atmosphere is going to have a certain temperature itself. And the atmosphere and everything that it does is going to take energy away from the surface. It's going to cool the surface by various processes. One of them is convection carry away heat by convection. So you get these convection currents in the atmosphere. One of them is the water cycle and the way that you can, uh, that you evaporate water from the surface, which is very important, and so on. So, the atmosphere cools the surface quite a lot. And we're, we were talking about the surface. And we're talking, that's where we live. We live at the surface. We're concerned about the temperature of the surface. Okay. So, it turns out, and that's what I showed in, in my paper, is that this is not from... In fact, the warming from greenhouse effect is actually much larger than 33 degrees. It's more like 60 degrees. Because it compensates not only for uh, the lack of greenhouse effect, but it has to compensate in order to, to come down to the... Sport. See, the thing... Here, here it is. Uh, yeah, I'm skipping steps. I'm, I'm going too fast. But um, uh, let's put it this way. We could repeat the calculation now and add the fact that some energy is being taken away from the surface by the atmosphere. And we know how that works. We know a lot about those processes. And we know, for example, that... Where did I write it down? Yeah, you see, when you do the full calculation, which we're just building ourselves up to here, we're going to take all that into account, okay? So I'm, I'm really, I'm taking initial steps just to introduce the concepts and so on. But let me tell you that the processes that we're going to add here that cool the surface, there are three of them, four of them. One is the atmosphere itself directly absorbs or reflects some of the radiation, like you were saying. Okay? That accounts for 78 watts per meter squared. Another one is there is an increase in albedo from the clouds. That's another one that you were mentioning. That changes the albedo. Another one is atmospheric thermal, the thing that allows you to go in glider airplanes and have a lot of fun. That's at 17 watts per meter squared. These things have been measured uh, quite accurately by satellite measurements and so on. And then there's the water cycle one, which is a full 80 watts per meter squared. So all of these are cooling effects due to the atmosphere. When you add those in and recalculate that equation, but you add those in onto that, onto the cooling side of the equation there on the surface, you can calculate, here's how we add it in. I could just show you the equation just quickly. So I'm going to use symbols instead of all these complicated, I'm going to use simpler symbols. A is the solar incoming radiation on the surface. So I'm going to write an equation for what happens at the surface. So this is what's coming in at the surface. So after I've reflected out some and absorbed some by the, by the atmosphere, I'm left with 161 watts per meter squared impinging on the surface. 
plus the atmosphere is also a surface. It's also matter like the table and it's emitting infrared radiation. So there's light from the sun coming onto the surface plus there's light from the atmosphere coming onto the surface. And part of that is from this infrared effect and so on. So that corresponds to the emissivity of the atmosphere times this fundamental constant times the temperature of the atmosphere to the fourth power. And that has to be equal to what is leaving the surface. So now I'm back to the emissivity of the surface, which I guess I denoted it that way, this fundamental constant, the temperature of the Earth's surface now to the fourth power plus the cooling from the thermals plus the cooling from the water cycle. And that becomes my new energy balance equation. Except that now this equation has two temperatures that I have to solve for. It, I have to solve it for the temperature of the atmosphere and for the temperature of the surface of the Earth. So this equation is the energy balance at the surface of the Earth with a simple atmosphere that is uniform and of a constant temperature everywhere to simplify things. Okay? And then I write down another equation which is the energy balance equation or the radiation balance equation for the atmosphere because there's stuff coming into the atmosphere, stuff going out of the atmosphere. I write that equation down here and because it's receiving infrared from the surface of the Earth there's terms in there so I will get another equation that's similar to this one that will have in it the temperature of the atmosphere and the temperature of the surface of the Earth. And though that's two equations in two unknowns and you've all taken algebra and you know that if you have two equations and two unknowns you can solve for those two unknowns under, under usual conditions. Okay? So then you solve for the temperature of this uniform atmosphere and the temperature of the surface of the Earth now in the presence of an atmosphere. And you get you get temperature of the surface of the Earth equals plus 10 degrees Celsius and temperature of the atmosphere equals minus 34 degrees Celsius. Do you realize how simple the calculation we just did? In our minds mostly, I didn't write it all out on the board, but how simple it is. It's really simple. Straight energy balance equations. This is all done in detail in, in, in my paper. That, that has been down a little lot and that's, it's all spelled out in detail in, in a paper that's on, online there. But look at this. We've got just the simplest possible atmosphere, the simplest possible situation, and we get a surface temperature for the Earth that's 10 degrees Celsius, only 4 degrees off the actual accepted value. It's amazing, isn't it? That with first year physics, you can get the right temperature, including the atmosphere of the Earth, to that degree of proximity. I mean, in Kelvin, these are hundreds of degrees Kelvin. They could have been, could have been anything, right? When you put it into Celsius, it's, it's almost the same. So this is quite remarkable. This is a remarkable thing that you could get that close with such a simple calculation. And then you just go from there. It just gets better and better as you make the calculation more and more realistic. So now we'll, next step, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, take the atmosphere to be a little more complicated than just a single uniform atmosphere, a shell. We'll take two layers and they'll be allowed to have two different temperatures. And so um, we'll see that the two different, that, that temperature in the atmosphere changes quite a lot with altitude. We'll see that different layers get colder and colder as you get higher and that there's a, there's a layer that's much colder than a bottom layer and so on. All of this will come out of our calculations we just keep doing the process that I've illustrated so far and we just have more equations in as many unknowns for the different temperatures of the different layers of atmosphere and we can just keep doing this. And what is surprising is that you get the same answer as a professional climatologist using a supercomputer with all his sophisticated <laughs> circulation models and everything. Okay? Um, and the reason is that all of the bells and whistles in those more complicated mo models are not needed 
to calculate the surface temperature of the Earth. They might be needed if you want to know how, the, how, how, things, how circulation is happening in the atmosphere, but if you're not curious about that, you just want to get the right temperature of the Earth, you, you only need to use a simple model like this. So that's what physicists do. They try to find the simplest model that will give the correct answer for the question they're asking. Otherwise, you're doing too much work for no good reason. So that is what you get. And then, once you've done that, and I'm coming to the conclusion of this physics part, once you've done that, then you ask the question, you do what's called sensitivity analysis. You say, well now, if I change the amount of CO2 in my atmosphere, how much will that change the surface temperature of the Earth? That becomes the next interesting question. And so to answer that question, you need to know spectroscopy. And that's where I come in. I was able to model very simply yet accurately what the resonant cross-section for greenhouse absorption of CO2 is and, and put that into my simple model and be able to calculate, therefore, what happens if you double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. What's that going to do? And so on. Okay? If you, let, let's say if you double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, what will that do to the surface temperature? So now we're doing what's called sensitivity analysis of the model. We're, we're changing things to find out what effect that will have on the surface temperature. And when you do that sensitivity analysis, what you find is well, first of all, doubling the amount of CO2, I find in my model that that increases the surface temperature of the Earth by 1.4 degrees Celsius. Doubling the amount of CO2. That's not just like the increase that's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years. That's doubling the amount of CO2. That's, that's, a, you know, that's a big factor. That would increase the temperature of uh, the surface of the Earth by 1.4 degrees Celsius. If you did just that alone, didn't change anything else. Okay? So that tells me right away that the only way I'm going to get a big change in temperature is if I do something more than just change the amount of CO2. And what these people do, by the way, that 1.4 degrees Celsius result that I get, it's the same number as these professional climatologists with their supercomputers. They go through all this sophisticated stuff and they've got you know, circulation in their models and everything, and they get the same number. They double it, change only CO2, they get about 1, 1 1.2, 1 1.4 degrees Celsius. Okay? Same answer. It's got to be the same answer. Simple, straightforward physics. It's radiation balance. Really simple. Okay, but then you compare, well, what happens if I change the uh, albedo of the surface of the Earth a little bit? Or what happens if I change the emissivity of the surface of the Earth a little bit? Well, that has a much bigger effect. A hundred times more effect than the CO2 alone. Two orders of magnitude. So what this means is that in terms of impacting the climate, if you change the property of the surface of the Earth, it's going to have a much bigger effect potentially. So you really should be worried about changes in land use on a large scale on the planet. If you're, if you're going to be honestly worried about global warming, you should be concerned about deforestation, water management, desert formation, uh, you know, uh, changing land use everywhere, making, making grasslands for cows instead of forests and all this kind of stuff is going to dramatically, it's known to dramatically affect emissivity and albedo. Emissivity in particular is very sensitive to water content. So dry grass is very different from a lush forest and so on. So these land use is way more important in terms of planetary radiation balance than CO2. A couple orders of magnitude. And all you have to do is this calculation. It tells you right away. A physicist will tell you right away. And so Nobody is looking at that because everybody's fixated on CO2 and we'll talk about why that is in, in, in the next part of, of this talk. Yeah? Uh, 
Before we move on, I, I don't mean to insult you by assuming that you haven't thought of this, but I would like to hear, hear you uh, at least... I don't get insulted bit. very easily. <laughs> that I know. Um, I, I would like to hear you touch on it at least a little bit. Uh, one of the main assumptions that you uh, presented in your initial calculations of the, the input and output uh, being yeah. equal is that it's a steady state. Yes. Um, of course, it could oscillate. Yes. Right? So, so it, you, it you does oscillate. The, the time, like, it, is it, does of it course oscillate, it oscillate over the year or does it oscillate over geological time scales? Oh, come on. Time scales? It's cold at night and warmer during the but, day. But that's not really what I mean, I, though. No, 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 but it's oscillating on all these time scales constantly. It's, it's, it's changing from place to place. It, you know, are you standing on the black uh, pavement or are you standing on a grassy field and so on? depending on where you are. That's the thing. It's, it's, it's all over the place in time and in space. There's no question about that. So what I'm and wondering so, about is, so could it be oscillating is, on a geological time scale? Could it go up by 10 degrees and then not correct Well, we're going to talk about that. Okay. We're going to talk about that, and that, that's, that's very important. Yes, that's very important. I'm going to show a really nice graph about that. Or anymore. So I'm going to show you a graph of concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere versus time. And on the same graph, temperature of the surface of the planet versus time. But time is going to go from the present to 400, 600 million years ago. So we're going to have a broad time to look at. It's the same planet. We're not changing very much. We're just looking at these two variables on the same planet. We're not going to some other solar system. And we're going to see what happens, okay? Here's the red, the temperature here. You follow that? Okay, look at here we are here, you know, we're, we're basically at 12 degrees, 14 degrees, whatever you want to call it. The geologists would say 12, the geographers would say 14, I would say they both are approximating and there's no way we're going to measure within a tenth of a degree, but whatever. We're at 12 here at the present time, but look at the path. We go all the way up a full 10 degrees Celsius. The temperature has often been at the average Earth temperature, 22 degrees Celsius, okay, over the last four or five million years. And nobody died. <laughs> no, but seriously, <laughs> look, there have been all these animals, complicated beings and plants, highly intelligent compared to people, I mean. <laughs> uh, you know, all these different, like all the way down to 450 million years, the, the planet has been thriving and alive with life. Are, you, are we seriously going to say that humans could not survive because the average global temperature is 22 degrees Celsius, let's say, where all these lush plants and animals live for hundreds of millions of years? that all of a sudden we get, oh God, it's hot in here! And we just like croak and die? Let's be serious. I, I, seriously. And, and it's not like we wouldn't have time to adapt in terms of getting, developing better air conditioners, moving to different parts of the planet, and so on. You know what I'm saying? Like, th this is, th the alarmism is frightening. Um, so, and the other thing, not just dinosaurs, but look, there have been insects all that time. Look at these guys. They're flying all over the place and they're eating plants. And there have been plants all this time. Hundreds of millions of years. All these complex plants and then the insects developing to mine the plants and to eat what they produce and so on, evolving together in this lush biosphere that has been on our planet for hundreds of millions of years. And all of a sudden, because we decide to burn a bit of fossil fuel, all of this is going to fall apart, the species are going to collapse and everything's going to die? But I think like, you're like, simplifying the concerns because like, a lot of the concern has to do with the uh, polar ice caps melting and the water levels. Yes. So, like, most humans but have, let me most start by simplifying the concerns. We'll start with a simple model and then we'll come down to your more complicated features, okay? Isn't the rate of change more important than, than the actual temperature sure. change? So, sure. When the rate of change is uh, sure. we went through mass extinction. 
Uh, that, that, okay. no. What about the, 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 the big one, the, 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 the um, at the Cretaceous boundary where all the dinosaurs were killed? Yeah. No, there, that was the Permian one. The, the two turned 50 million years ago one. Permian. The Great Dying Extinction. Oh, yeah. Right. Was that during the Carbonaceous uh, period? Was that, is that? I thought it was Permian. Uh, Permian. Where is that? So you're talking about this sudden change here? So you're saying there were a lot of people who were used to a cooler climate and less CO2 in the atmosphere and all of a sudden this would have caused something? Well, it was the largest extinction in history and the rates have changed now. Okay, well, we're trying, it's like we're using a telescope trying to look 200 million years back see what happened, okay? We're still arguing about how the dinosaurs died. When I was a graduate student, it was a massive meteorite that hit in the Gulf of Mexico and all this stuff and it was this nuclear winter light thing and that, that's what killed the dinosaurs. And when, then when I was a research professor, a whole team of German scientists spent decades uh, discovering that it wasn't the meteorite that killed the dinosaurs at all, that it was, there was hypervolcanic activity in that period and you can see lava flows that date to precisely that time and that, it's that volcanic activity that caused this winter that would have killed the dinosaurs and so on. So, I mean, how can we, these stories about the past that depend on uh, interpreting a fossil record and so on, it's really hard to do. So I want to start, instead of arguing about those details, I want to start with the overall observation that there's been a lush life a lush biosphere on the planet for hundreds of millions of years and that things are way more robust, living things are way more robust than uh, we like to think. For example, um, um, uh, just, just, just to continue my thought one more second, um, it's the large animals that are more susceptible to having problems, right? Like now, it's the large mammals that are in the greatest danger of extinction. You're, you're always going to have bacteria. You're always going to have insects. You're always going to have smaller animals. The large ones are really in danger. So, but, the, but there's always, this, despite that general rule, it's the large animals that have mostly disappeared. In quantity, the smaller animals as well, but they survive and they continue to evolve. Um, so the, the, the point here is that you, you know, there are a lot of papers about species extinction. And since we're mainly concerned about the large mammals, you have to ask yourself, okay, are the lions becoming extinct because the planetary surface is warming? Or are they becoming extinct because we're destroying their habitat? Are, in, in fact, if you look at all the large mammals and all the species that can be found to become extinct, and there's a lot of debate about this, and sometimes species are found to become extinct, and then 10 years later they discover that they weren't extinct, and so on. This happens all the time. But it's very, th this whole science of measuring extinction rates of species is, is very tenuous. It's very difficult to do, uh, from my readings at least, I, I, I tend to think. Um, so. It's about habitat destruction. It's not about global warming. In fact, I have developed a sequence of questions in relative importance here that kind of addresses this. For example, I've got a ladder of questions here. The first question is, are humans exploiting and terrorizing other humans? Yes or no? <laughs> Okay? Is that happening on a large scale? Yes. yes or no? Okay. Are humans able to do something about that? In principle, they should be able to do something about that if they want to stop doing it, right? Okay. Next question. Are human, are, 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 are human environments being poisoned? Yes. yes. Of course they are. You, you go, tra I've traveled to Latin America where people live in communities where a large Canadian mining company has established itself and completely depleted the water tables and poisoned the water and you name it, people are dying and so on. This is happening all the time. So human 
environments where people live are being poisoned. This is a question of toxicity and pollution. It's not about CO2. It's not about predicting whether or not uh, the, 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 the uh, global mean average temperature is going to change by more than 2 degrees in the next 20 or 50 or 100 years. It's about something that's happening now. Here's another question. Is habitat of animals, is habitat and people being destroyed? Is habitat being destroyed? Are forests being destroyed? Are natural habitats everywhere on the planet being destroyed? And is that happening on a large scale? Of course it is. It's massive. Oh, but let's have all our scientists try to figure out if CO2 is going to increase the mean average temperature of the planet by two degrees in the next 20 years. Let's not have them comment on whether or not habitat is being destroyed and, how, and all the repercussions of that. Our species, now, now as we move into my questions here, you're going to see that the questions, the answers become not so clear as you move up this last. Our species becoming extinct. That's more difficult. Yes, large mammals are at danger due to habitat destruction. That's pretty clear. How the heck do you measure how many species are becoming extinct? There's, there's what, 40,000 species of ants? How do you measure, how do you measure that 20% of them are disappearing every 20 years or something, you know? How do you evaluate that? These, so you've got these scientists that are experts at trying to estimate that. And I would postulate that what they're doing is not very reliable. And a lot of that extinction is bound to happen anyways. But I would say that the majority is certainly due to changes in habitat. The next